um, would you guys join me in prayer here as we jump into the word this morning? Lord, thank you. Thank you for your presence. God, thank you for your kindness. Lord, for all that you're doing in the midst of this morning, Lord, in our families. And God, we just invite you once again, Lord, come and breathe on this time. Holy Spirit of God, I thank you that you're speaking to people, that you are, you are leading and facilitating. You're helping, God. You're doing so much in our lives, and we just want to say thank you this morning. Would you say thank you to him? Thank you, Lord. Just acknowledge you, Lord, in our way. Uh, in, in our ways, Lord, we acknowledge you. You're in the midst of it all. And God, this morning, just as we look into your word, I'm asking that you would unlock the spirit of revelation and wisdom. God, that we would be transformed on the inside from seeing truth and that our lives would walk in wisdom and carry out that truth so that others are impacted. I thank you for that, Lord. I bless our time together in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that or agreed with that, you said, amen. 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 I was... Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, this, this day is a special day, obviously. It's been set apart. It's a holiday that originated in America, you know, and the, uh, it did. Uh, and just honoring of family, other honoring of moms. It was, my wife uh, looked into it this morning, just the origination point, and, and uh, the origination point was from somebody who wanted to honor their mom. And, uh, and, and so they, you know, made the experience available to others and shared it, and then other people, and it caught on, you know? I mean, and, and thankfully, it did, because it's worth celebrating, worth honoring, valuing our moms. You wouldn't be here without her, huh? Anybody could say, nope, I got here without my mom. Nope, you cannot, okay? All of our lives have been impacted deeply, and that's, that's all of it. It's positive, negative. There's all of it. But I, I want you to consider something this morning. And, and this is not the sermon, but it, it, um, it, it is a, a side point, if you will. But it, it's a main theme of value in this house. And that is that the generations of those who've gone before you, whether you knew them or not, are impacting your life right now. Somebody else at some point in history, you do not know who they are. You've never met them. But somebody in history had made choices of sacrifice, and it has led to a good outcome on your benefit. You are the product, not just of your own choices, but there is, there's a generational heritage that you are a part of. There's blessing. There is an inheritance spiritually that you're walking in, and it's accredited to people you've never met. You might say to me, Pastor Jamie, I'm the first believer in my family. I doubt it. You just didn't go back far enough. Truly. People have walked with the Lord all throughout history, and you and I are benefiting from their sacrifices. And that is the essence, I think, of motherhood. Sacrificial living, it's the choice to, to lay down your life for someone else. It's, it's amazing. I always say to young couples, you know, especially if, if, if I am a part of their, their process of getting married, you know, I'll say to them, listen, you don't realize how selfish you are until you get married. You have no idea how selfish you are. You just, you're just living life and you're making decisions and you think it's just you, you know, and, and but when you get married... That all changes. Now you are accountable to somebody. Now you are making decisions that are going to affect somebody else. And suddenly you realize how selfish you are. And, uh, and then it turns a corner. Because I will tell you that the moment of greatest revelation comes about how deeply selfish you are comes with the birth of the child. Because that little one does not care that you haven't slept yet. <laughs> doesn't care if you haven't eaten and not feeling well. Not, it doesn't care. It is calling for someone else to lay down their life on their benefit. It, it, it happens. It's necessary. That's part of the process. You know, it's one of the great joys in life is to lay your life down for someone else, yeah? It's to sacrifice. There's so much joy 
in not being selfish, but instead choosing to benefit others. It's where there's love and joy expressed. It's an amazing experience. And moms just, you know, they, they, <laughs> they are the, the version of that that we see that's just so obvious. You know, but today, in the celebration side of things, I, I want to I wanna say something to you. I, you know, not everybody on Mother's Day is, like, excited about it. I, I had a conversation after service this morning. They said this is the first time they come to church on a Mother's Day and not cried in grief because their journey wasn't the same as others, you know, and it's been a struggle, this process of motherhood, the identity of that, the sense of loss, you know, and and you may be sitting near people that are in that place. So I want to say to you today that that the, the kingdom of heaven calls to believers to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, and when, we're, when we choose to set aside our own personal sort of, I don't want to call it a need, but our sense of self, the things we want, when we set that aside in order to engage where someone else is at. So if I'm in grief, I can set it aside and I can rejoice with someone else. The reason I can do that is because I trust the Lord. Without trust, it's very difficult to celebrate when you are in pain, to celebrate somebody else's journey, to be happy for, to these things. And so in a congregation, you know, like this size in this room, there are people who have not necessarily, uh, like this has been a a process for people and uh, a journey. And I want to talk about that this morning. I really do. I, I, I feel like one of the central and core issues to the faith has to do with trust, trust in the Lord. When um, Nicole and I uh, got married, uh, she was 20 years old. I was 19. We have been married 26 years, going on 27 this year. Am I right? You think so. Okay. We're... <laughs> That's a good woman right there, by the way. Uh, if she's unsure about the date, then I'm safe. <laughs> I have made so many little faux pas with my, my mouth setting up here where I'm like, I'll st- we've been married over 25 years, but we've been married 26 years, and I'll, you know, be lovingly reminded when I get home. <laughs> but when we got married, uh, that journey of, you know, thinking about family and that stuff, it was so far out of our minds. We were not considering it, except for when we got married, we eloped. And uh, in that eloping process, I was in the military, and, and I was about to get my first set of orders, and we needed Nicole's name on my orders if she was going to go with me. And, uh, and so we, we decided, we hatched this scheme. We, got, we decided we were, we were already engaged, but let's just go ahead and let's elope. Let's get married. So, and then we turn the paperwork in. We'll get you on my orders. And then later on when we have the ceremony, because there's a planned ceremony, the big one, you know, uh, we'll just pretend like nothing happened. Yeah, that's a good plan, right, mom and dad? Yeah, mm-hmm. No, not a good plan. Don't do this, young people. Don't do this. So we, we went ahead and we got married and we didn't tell anybody. <laughs> we just did it. And, uh, and then I got orders. And this would have been the like, yay, it all worked, right? Except for my orders were to the DMZ in Korea. I was going to be on the border between South and North Korea. And spouses aren't allowed to go. And so I got orders that took me away, and she couldn't come anyway. I know, everybody pity. Okay, oh, yes. Okay, keep moving the story along. We, uh, so we, we eloped, and anyway, it didn't end up mattering, but I'm there. And, and so our first 18 months of marriage, we lived together for three. Not a great way of starting out, but this is the way our journey started out. And so I, I'm over there. This is in the late 90s, 1997, and... Uh, we have this distance, you know, uh, marriage now, and, and uh, we eventually told parents we had a ceremony and all that stuff, and so we ended up being able to, to uh, be public with it, praise God. But 
I'm stationed over there, and, and there's not a phone available. I have to walk down across the post to get down to a pay phone, and, and they have winter. It's on the same parallel as Minnesota is. It's a ba- roughly the same climate where I was at. And, and so I'm out there in the cold. I'm talking to my wife, and one night we got talking about family, thinking about the future. And I said to her, and again, I'm 19. I'm missing my wife. She's 20. And I say to her, I want to have eight children. And she said, who's having those kids? <laughs> Nikki, at that point in our life, wasn't actually even, she wasn't sure she even wanted children. And I, I'm saying, I want eight. And so at the very beginning of our marriage, we've got this like, ooh, this might be a point of tension. It's coming, right? And uh, we didn't really talk about it at that point, but fast forward our journey, and, and now we're, uh, we're, we're in our 20s. We're stationed in Germany. We're living together. And, and, uh, and the Lord began to work on our hearts and prepare us for family. And the Holy Spirit started to speak to Nicole, started to speak to me. You know you're ready for kids when you get around other people's children and suddenly they're cute. You're like, wow, I didn't even know how cute a child was. Like, maybe we want one of those, Right? This is why it's dangerous. Don't hold other people's babies unless you are ready, right? So anyway, we're, we're in that moment, and we didn't know, but the Lord was working on our hearts. And, and I was to the point where I was like, yeah, no, I want to start a family. And, and Nikki wasn't sure. And so there's this crisis moment where the Lord had to come to her, and he began to say to her, I want you to trust me with planning your family. I, I want you to go from having a closed grip where you are determining what takes place to opening your hand and allowing the Lord to bring something that you were not planning for. You got to let go of control. If you're going to trust, it means you have to let go of control. And so this moment, the Lord is asking us to trust him and let go of control. And so that journey, and finally we got to that place, and, and that, that place in the Lord where you're, you, like, it's scary. It's so scary. And we released control, and, and, and very soon after, very soon after, we were pregnant. Yay! Okay, let me, let me think, think about this. We were not ready. We were not there. We had a lot of conflict in our marriage. We, there's all sorts of these things. The Lord brings us through that season. He's talking to us about trusting him with planning our family. We get to that place of wrestling. and We go, yes, Lord, we'll trust you. And we let go. And immediately there's a response. Immediately. We're pregnant. Wow. Like God prepares you for what's coming. What we were not ready for is the appointment at the beginning of the second trimester, where they go to, they look for the heartbeat, and there's no heartbeat. And now we're sitting there with what felt like God leading us, us letting go, him, I mean, enabling us to have a child, and suddenly the child's, wait, what do you mean there's no heartbeat? That is not possible. God led us to this place. How could this be the place of worst pain we've ever experienced. How can God be a part of this process? Have you ever been here? If you haven't been here, you haven't walked with the Lord long enough and or you're believing in American Jesus, not the real one. Because an American Jesus says, yay, everything's sunshine and roses, no trouble. The real Jesus said, in this world, there's going to be a lot of problems, but take heart. I already overcame it, and so you can too. And so we're facing this moment, and it would eventually lead to the loss, full loss, and it was violent. Nikki got so, it was bad. We're hospitalized, and there's surgery, and blood transfusions, and pain, and fear to try to survive the moment now. We're laying in the hospital room. This is a true story. This is the story of our family. We're laying in the hospital bed together, twin bed. I'm laying next to my wife, and we are grieving. And we don't know how to process this. And in the midst of that, the Lord walks in the room and talks to us. 
His presence, so tangible, and clarity of thought, so clear. It's as clear as we hear the Lord's voice. And he said, I want you to trust me to plan your family. Talk about an inappropriate statement. I, come on, are you kidding me? Jesus, can you see that we're grieving here? We're in a ton of pain here, and you move immediately. There's not like a counseling. There wasn't like, I mean, come on. Like if, if you, someone you know goes through a pain place, and they're in a pace, place of grief. You come alongside them. You're like, it's going to be okay. And you're, you're consoling them and you're loving them. And you're caring for them. Why? So that, that they know you're there and it's comforting. And, and does Jesus do that? Listen, kinder, gentler Jesus. Let's talk about this for a moment. Kinder, gentler Jesus. Jesus walks and never offends anyone, right? Except for the religious and the, the, the politics. And, 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 but he's walking with people and he's loving on people and he's so kind and you can see that. Listen, did you know that Jesus was rose from the dead and ascended to a place of authority that is above every other name of authority? He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he is sitting on a throne. Now there is grace And there is mercy, but let me tell you, when the Lord speaks, he is demanding change. He's asking for obedience. And his love and his kindness are absolutely present when he says this to us, but he demands us. it's, It's not an ultimatum. He just says, I want you to trust me to plan your family. And so now suddenly we're in a place of crisis. Will we trust him? Can I tell you, this brought me back. I'll come back to this moment in this story, but I want to, I want to, there's a parallel process that I was going through personally. See, when I was 15 years old, my mom pulled me into the kitchen of the church that we were a part of, and it's just a private conversation. No one else is around. I remember it so clearly. I have my back to the counters, and my mom is standing right in front of me, and she says, Jamie, I have to tell you something. It's important, and so I need you just to listen. I said, what's up, Mom? I said, I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm about to go into, you know, treatment, and we're about to have to walk through a journey as a family. It's going to be hard. You know, but the Lord is with us. This is the kind of conversations happening. 15 years old. You know what happened to me? I went into a place of crisis internally. I didn't tell anybody about it. I did not process out loud with anybody. But what happened on my insides was this. This divorcing from, wait, I thought God was our God. And so if God is our God and he's good, then, then everything in our life is going to be good. I'm, as a 15-year-old, I'm working with, you know, that uh, it's, it's not the maturity of an adult, you know, and I'm, and I'm processing this and instantly in my heart, this is what took place. I realized, wait a second, I don't know if I can trust God with the outcome of things. This is the thought. It came with my mom's words. It wasn't my mom speaking, but it was something speaking, sowing into my heart a lack of trust towards God. And so suddenly I find in myself, I'm like, wait a second, I don't know. I pulled back from church. As a 15-year-old, I was like, "Ah, I don't think I want to be a part of that anymore. The thing that represents the God that my parents serve, and now my mom has cancer and she's dying. And I'm like, I don't, I think I'm done. I just stepped back. I didn't really like church anyway, you know, 15-year-olds and I don't know, whatever. And, And I didn't. I don't want to be a part of it. So I just pulled back. I pulled back relationally from church people and religion. And I, I just dug into my friends at school and sports and all that jazz. And, and I went to a far off place morally. I was bankrupt morally. Okay. I, I was destructive. I was so angry. And this is what I didn't realize is that when you trust the Lord, when you have trust for God, it, the word trust literally means somebody that is protecting your six. They, they, are, they are the one who is behind you. They're, they're your rear guard. 
They're the, they're the one who, who, you know, you don't have to think about all the ramifications of stuff because God has your back. And I didn't realize that when you're in faith and when you're in trust, God has your back. And so you don't have to worry about all that stuff. But this is what took place when I was like, I don't trust God. Suddenly the weight of the world came crashing in. And I started having anxiety and fear and anger. Ooh, anger. I got angry. Not normal kind of anger. Raging kind of anger. And the only thing that would quiet that storm was drugs and alcohol. Because I was raging on the inside. But the rage was coming from fear, y'all. It's coming from the anxiety and the weight of the world that I'm not meant to carry. It's coming from demonic delusion and the fear that comes from demons. All that stuff comes crashing into a 15-year-old's life because he has now proclaimed, I don't trust God. So it's open season. The enemy attacking, and I'm under it. And I'm in the far-off country, if you will, as the prodigal son story. And I'm angry at God and people and man alive. And I'm just, I'm in this terrible place. But the whole time, my mother, who's in the middle of cancer treatment, is praying. And she doesn't stop praying. She is praying for me. She gets all her friends together to pray for me. I tell you, I've met many of my mother's friends since then. And people I've never met before that moment, the first thing they tell me is, oh, you're Debbie's son? Man, she prays for you. Ask everyone to be praying for her son's salvation. Come back to the Lord. That whole bit. Pray that the prodigal comes home. And it got really intense there for a while. My senior year of high school, this is what happens. I'm sitting in the first hour of my senior year of high school. It's an economics class. And Jesus walks in. I have a full-blown encounter with the Lord. And I was expecting kinder, gentler Jesus, wouldn't you? But this is what, he rolls up on me, and he says, it's now or never. Only words he says, it's now or never. Just like that. Now or never. Make the choice. Then he walks away. That's sobering, to say the least. I would surrender my life to Jesus and the Lord encountered me in this love, and he washed me, and I felt the rage unhook, pull off of me, most likely something demonic. I am free now, and I'm forgiven. And one year later, my mother passed away. She got to see me return, and she prayed me in. And now still today, she's a living intercessor. The cloud of witnesses up there interceding, praying for y'all. You know, don't think that place is a far off place. This is not a far off place. It's a very thin veil actually between here and there. Fast forward, here's this moment. I'm laying in bed with my wife. Jesus has now said, trust. Will you let me plan your family? Trust me. <laughs> I had no idea how many little, uh, they're called strongholds. It's when you have a thought that's not God's thought, but you begin to build a case against truth. Right? When, you're, when you build a case against truth, you, you have situations come up and you, you interpret what happens to you through the lie you believe. So can I trust God? I'll just ask it like that. Can I trust God? <laughs> You're not sure, are you? Okay, yeah. Okay, can I trust God? Yes, of course. That's truth. You can. You can trust God. He's trustworthy. But every time in my life that I had something go away that I did not plan for or I did not want to have happen, it's just another brick in the wall to protect my own pain. I'm building a case to wall off against trusting God. And that's what happened in my life up until this point. So now I'm facing another crisis, and Jesus goes, will you let me trust, will you trust me to let you plan your family? And his love and his, listen, when the Lord asks you for something, it's, it's not a chore to say yes to him. It's, it's the after stuff that's the problem. <laughs> yes, Lord, 
now, would you make sure now that never happens again? Yes, Lord, but, eh, yes, Lord, but, explain it to me one more time. Help me to understand so that I can really agree with you. Yes, Lord, I'll do it, of course. Now explain, right? We do that. And I'm in that moment of crisis when his kindness and his mercy, his love, you're like, okay, no, this, I can trust the person Jesus. Trustworthy. I can trust my Father in heaven. My God, I can trust him. Can I trust Big Pharma? You alive this morning? Are you okay? Hello. Hi. Happy Mother's Day. You're in church, remember. Okay, elbow your neighbor. Wake them up if they're sleeping. All right. Can you trust Big Pharma? Thank you. Okay. How about big business? No, you really can't. Why? Because there's a motive, a hidden motive behind everything they do. Okay, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to move a little closer to offense, okay? You ready? Can you trust government, <laughs> big government? No, no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, let's slow it down a second, okay? Do you know why, why trust towards these things is difficult? Is because these are systems. They are not people with conscience. There's people in them, but, but, no, no. Policy runs government, right? Systems, the love of money runs business. It's a system. You know, big pharma has use, but it's a system. Can you trust it? No, because it has an ulterior motive, right? But can you trust God? Okay, follow-up question. Can you trust church? No. Well, that's a something for a pastor to say in the pulpit of a church. This is the thing that I think people bump into, especially when they say, I'm mad at God. or I'm, No, I'm, I, they have pain in their life related to previous experiences with systems. And so you may have attended a church that hurt you. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I really am. I'm, I'm so sorry that happened to you. But that does not create an opportunity for you to say, I don't trust God. It's not equal. I got hurt by church. That's why I'm not a Christian anymore. No. Let's separate some things. You got hurt by church, which is a system of religion, which is supposed to represent God, but didn't. I'm so sorry that happened. The Lord is not a system, and he is not religion. He is trustworthy. His leadership is trustworthy, and you can trust him. And so when he asks something of you, you can say yes without any reservation. So we said, yes, Lord, we, we're willing. We'll trust you with the planning of our family. We got pregnant with Josiah. He's now 21 years old. Praise God. This process, I don't want to belabor this story. Some of you know where this is going. But this process for us, I want you to think back to those days in Korea. I said as a 19-year-old young man, I said, I want to have eight kids. We have eight children right now. We have eight kids. Okay? It was not planned that way. Okay? Not by us, at least. All right? But the Lord's goodness and his faithfulness made sure that it happened. Are you kidding me? All right? All right, and you know it wasn't man's plan because I have one son and I have seven daughters. <laughs> That's not the way people plan things. It's the glory and beauty of my life. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't have it any other way. It's so amazing. But come on, dude, you wouldn't have planned that. But what happened, y'all, is that every other pregnancy ended in loss. And not of all of them were easy. It wasn't just, oh, that's really too bad. You can try again. No, actually two times my wife almost lost her life trusting God. Multiple times. I mean, you can't tell me. Now, some from the outside, you look at our family and go, wow, 
beautiful family, you know, and, and if you get within proximity, you get to see the dynamics of that, and we love that. There's so much beauty in our life, okay? But you have no idea what it costs to get there because we have eight kids in heaven. I think it's just amazing. I asked for eight kids, and God went, all right, you can have eight in heaven, and you can have eight here to steward now, right? I think it's a comparison so that we get there and we find out who did a better job of raising them, you know? Like... But did you know that every single time, every single time that there was a loss or a birth, the Lord would come. He would follow up. We, we began to understand he's going to come again. He would follow up every single loss with that question again. Will you sign up again and trust me? Will you open your hand? I know you just experienced pain. Will you open your hand again and trust me? Jesus, how in the world can you... You're the God of comfort, but you don't spend any time comforting. Ah, that's because trusting the Lord is the process to get you out of pain. You're in grief that is unrelenting because you don't trust the Lord. That's why. Grief is a tunnel you walk through. It is not a camp. You don't live there. So if you find yourself in that place where you just can't get out of the cycle of grief or pain or you're in fear and anxiety, ah, It's trust. Open the hand again. Invite Jesus back in to be Lord over it and let go. I'm telling you, your pain is attached to control. Isn't that a fun word there? Happy Mother's Day. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Let's, Let's read a Bible verse. Here we go. Proverbs 3. Verses 5 through 6. Should have got here earlier. Sorry about that. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That word heart means the center of your being. The place you make decisions from. Your heart. Not cerebral. Not your mind. Not thinking it through. Your heart. Trust is not a choice like that. Trust is in the heart. The center of your being. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. This is a fantastic verse of instruction. He he says, trust in me. Trust. I got your back. That's what that word means. I got your six. I got your back. You don't have to be worrying about everything creeping up behind you. I've washed your past clean. Leave it. Walk towards where I'm leading you. Follow the path. Fix your eyes ahead. Fix your eyes on me. Keep moving forward. Let me take care of everything else. That is what trusting the Lord looks like. You don't have to control all the outcomes. You don't have to try to manipulate and push to get your desire to take place. You don't have to do that. Just let go. Trust the Lord. He's in your process. He's with you in this. Trust the Lord. Understanding is not where decisions come from. Understanding is this, not this. Understanding is, well, tell me more before I say yes, Jesus. Your heart goes, ah, he's trustworthy. Yes. Your brain will figure it out later. And that has been our process over and over and over. We trust him. We walk through something. There are joys. There are pains. We, it's um, incredible. But I, I can tell you that the life that we live, the beauty that we live with, I would have never chosen on my own. We would not be where we are at in our life or in our relationships. None of it. We wouldn't have chosen any of it. It wasn't understanding. Oh, look at the way you plotted your course. Man, you're a smart guy. No. That's, evidently, that's what that sounds like. Yeah, all right. See? Okay, come on over, see? Trust me, see? That thing... Is where understanding lives, but trusting the Lord from the heart, making decisions before you understand. Trust him and watch as he protects, he keeps, and he leads you into good things. Amen? Amen. 
Trust the Lord. Let's do one more passage here, and we'll just walk through it. This is Psalms 37. I really, really, really enjoy Psalms 37 because Psalms 37 is uh, 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 the scriptural version of how you bring transformation to your nation. If you're looking for a plan, it's Psalms 37. Do you want to you know, you want to you transform America, or you want to lead her back to God, you want to do whatever that is, Psalms 37. It's King David reflecting on his life. He's an old man at this time when he writes this psalm. And he's reflecting about the nation of Israel, God's nation, right? God's people. And all the experiences that they had. David as king leading the nation. They've defeated enemies. They've had to go to war many times. They're now living in a time of prosperity where David has, he's, there's a rule that's being set and Solomon's coming. So they're about to become the most influential nation in the world. David's reflecting on all this. And he looks back and he goes, ah, if I could give people advice, this is what I would tell them about living in a nation. Trust in the Lord, verse 3. 37.3, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he'll do it. He's going to bring forth your righteousness as the light, your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out a wicked scheme. Don't fret. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to you doing evil. For evildoers get cut off from the land, but those who wait for the Lord, they inherit the land. That advice right there, whoo, that's fire right there. Fire. Fire. That'll transform. That'll transform a city. Right there. That. Pastor Jamie, I'm not even sure what you just said. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Okay? Verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. That instruction right there, that gets you all the way home. Trust in the Lord. Your center of your being. Let's put our trust in God. Let's stop trying to control to get outcomes. Let's, try, let's stop trying to control others. Let's stop trying to control through whatever means. Let's stop trying to control all of the outputs and inputs. Let's trust and cease from wrath, from trying to force our way. Trust. But what do we do, Lord? If I'm not clamping down trying to force my way because I have a good idea about what things are supposed to happen like, and this is what I think should take place. Yeah, you have some wonderful ideas. I think that's amazing. Get voted in. Bring some laws about. That's awesome. Do all that. Trust in the Lord. And what should you do? You should do good. What should you spend your life doing? You should spend your life adding value to the community you're supposed to be rooted in. That's what you should do. This is what it says. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. That is literally put your roots down so that you can develop a reputation of adding value. Put roots down. What do you mean by that? Well, if you're just going to leave here and move to Texas anyway, bye. <laughs> bye. Love you. Bye. Why do I say it like that? Well, because if you're not going to put roots down, if you're not invested, then you're only going to be the people that are full of wrath and making decisions, shaking their fist. And you won't help us. To do what? To do good and to cultivate faithfulness and to transform our cities and bring forth good things in our state and in our nation. If you're looking for the answer on the outside coming to you from afar, or the supernatural hand of God that just transforms everything, I'm sorry, but that isn't even how things work. Nope, God invites us to put roots down, to cultivate faithfulness. Faithfulness is literally to be consistent in doing what? In adding value to the community that you're a part of. 
This is David saying to his nation, y'all, we have been at war. We have been at peace. We're in a time of prosperity. Look at our lives. You know how we got here? We get here by trusting the Lord, not the sword. By trusting the Lord, not the plan. By trusting the Lord, not just leaders. And then we're going to do good. And we're going to be so consistent at doing good to the people around us that it affects our community. And I've got my roots down. That means I'm not bailing when things get tough. Or, hey, I hear Texas is nice this time of year. God bless you. But I will tell you, if everyone from California and everyone from Minnesota moves to Texas, it ain't going to be a great place very long. Huh. <laughs> Did I hit your button yet? I'll get there. I'm telling you, I'm working at it. <laughs> Some of you actually already are moving to Texas. God bless you. I'm not really, I'm, I'm not, I have nobody in my mind thinking of anybody. All right, so. <laughs> Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he'll do it. This thing This is like what happened with Nicole and I, okay? Is that when you entrust your life and your future to the Lord, you know he's going to turn all of it for good. It's going to produce something good. It really is. If you're focusing on adding value and doing good to people and you're cultivating faithfulness, consistency, you're, you're looking, you're pouring your life out to help people. Who's got your back? Who's going to bring forth in the stuff you want? Because the world says this, listen, nobody is going to help you. You're on your own. If you want to become rich, then you're going to have to do it. You're going to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. If you want to accomplish anything in the world, you got to work real hard, son. Do it. Right? Yeah, working hard is a good thing. But uh, if you are always focused on achieving and trying to get what you want, then you will be these people that control and try to force and manipulate outcomes. And when you force and try to manipulate an outcome because this is what I want to have happen, it is at war with your trust in the Lord. These are opposites. You cannot try to force change and let go at the same time. You got to choose Trust the Lord, and he, right, delight yourself in his ways. He'll cause the desire. He knows who you are. He knows how he's wired you. He knows what's inside your heart. He's not vindictive or evil. He's a good father. His plan for your life, your family, it's so much better than anything you could come up with. I'm being serious here. I would not have chosen the life that I have, but it's so much better than the one I planned. Let me say a truth, and it'll cut like a knife, okay? Just hear it. Trusting in the Lord is not a shortcut for getting what you want. Trusting the Lord is not a means to the end of getting what you want. When you treat it like that, then when things do not go the way you expected it, you rage at God, saying, where were you? Psalms 2 says, the nations are in an uproar, and they're plotting a vain thing. They're saying to the Lord, get your authority off of us. This is Psalms 2. It reads like a storybook for our day and age right now. If you want to know what God's doing in the nations, this is what he's doing. And Jesus is in heaven. And from that point of view, it's really funny to have little men going, I'll control and throw off your yoke, God. You can't do anything to us. It's really funny to look at a little man who maybe is full of power here on earth, raging at God saying, you can't force change. 
The Lord ah, sits back, has a little laugh to himself, and then goes ahead and picks up the scepter and brings his authority into the picture. God's purposes will be accomplished in the earth. They're going to happen. When we walk in trust to the Lord, we let go of the outcomes. We walk in obedience, but we let go of the outcomes. And when you do that, the Lord brings out a better outcome than you ever could have wanted. I wouldn't have chosen that my mother pass away, but can I tell you that there was such an awakening in my family? There, and I have an intercessor in heaven. I'm telling you, I don't know why the Lord had use of her more than we had use, but there is clearly a plan that is bigger than my ideas. Got one more verse. It compliments fairy. But do good. That's how you overcome evil. I, that one, look at this. I just, we got to do this one real, just real quick. Okay. Verse 37, or excuse me, uh, verse 6. He's going to bring forth righteousness as the light and judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. And then it says, do not fret. Okay. Why would we fret? Okay, fret is to burn with anger. It's things are not going the way that I plan, or so no, I'm really ticked off. That's fretting. Okay? Why would we fret in light? Remember, David's talking to his nation. He's saying, hey, this nation is the Lord's, our country. How do we want it to go? Well, let me give you some advice cultivate faithfulness, do good, be a blessing, right? And do not fret because of the people that you see doing evil and getting away with it. Do not fret. Don't get upset because an evildoer makes a decision, gets wealthy off of it, and outcomes are negative. Don't fret because of it. Look at this. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carried out a wicked scheme. Cease from your anger and forsake your wrath. In other words, I'm trying to get my way and I'll force it because fret will lead only to you doing evil. And evildoers cannot stay in the land. Sometimes we get all worked up because the stuff we're seeing happen around us, but man, you got to remember the Lord is the one in charge. You Put your trust in him, amen? Amen. Do not overcome evil, or excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, okay. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4. Got one more passage and one story, and then we'll close her down. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Now, the word trust is not in there, really, anywhere, except for this is not possible unless you trust the Lord. It is so difficult when, when you have a need to let go of your need and focus on helping someone else. That's so difficult. Who's got my back? Who's gonna help me? This is this is what happens. When you have a goal and you're trying to achieve it and then you have to set it down to go help someone else. This this process, how do I let go of the things I want to see happen? You're asking me, Lord, to not focus all my energy on me and my family getting ahead. Me and my journey succeeding. You're asking me to stop thinking about me and my journey and my retirement and where I want to live and the stuff I want to do in my dreams. You're asking me, Lord, to let go of that stuff and help other people. How can you do that? unless you trust that the Lord is going to bring out good in your life as you sacrifice and lay your life down for others. 
We could, we're in a world that is screaming at all of us. If you don't do it, then no one will. You have to do it. You, your plan of prosperity, your money, it's all you, 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 selfish, centered. And if you're not careful, as a person in the kingdom, you can begin to think that way that I need to take care of myself and my family and I got to do all this stuff because it won't happen otherwise. And I, I want to just encourage you today that, that the life that you have to force your way to get, to achieve, that that's not even a life worth living. You'll be imprisoned by it later. You'll build a business that you have to maintain. And that's a lot of work. But if you and Jesus go to work every day together, then this is his problem too. It ain't just yours. Amen, Pastor James. That was a great word there. <laughs> just encourage myself in the Lord this morning. That's <laughs> Share an experience and then we'll close it. The, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to fully explain the experiences, so you're just going to have to live with that. That's going to be fine. I had a dream. In the dream, I'm in this really, really dark room. Like, the no light coming from anywhere, except for across the room, there is a doorway, and the door is open, and there is so much light coming through the doorway. Like, brilliant light it's not illuminating the room. It's just that you can see the light. And so I start walking towards the light because this is what you do. When you're, in, when you're in ignorance, you walk towards what you know, the truth. That's what you're supposed to do. So I see the lights, and I'm walking towards it. And as I'm stepping forward, though, there are other men, and I know in my mind these are influencers, they're people of influence, in suits walking across my path. But none of them are going this way. They're all perpendicular, crossing my path. And as I'm walking, there's all these guys crossing my path. No one's going this way. They're all going different ways than me. And I know, oh, those are their journeys. This is my journey, right? And so, so as I'm walking towards this door, and, and there's way more to this. I don't, it's not relevant to, to this conversation this morning. But as I'm walking to this door, I, I arrive at it. And again, the room is still very dark. You can't see. But, and, I, and because I'm in darkness and I'm looking out into brilliant light, I also can't see what's on the other side of the door. And so I put my hands on the door frame, one on either side, and I lean forward through the door, my head into the other side. And as soon as I do, this wave whoo, fills my soul of joy and peace, love, I mean, it's brilliant, like saturates my being with hope. Lean through this door and I look and it's green fields and pastures and trees and beauty. And instantly I am terrified, terrified. Step back from the door. Whoa, wait, Lord, what is this? Because that feels like heaven. And I am not ready to cross that bridge. Now you tell me, which am I more rooted in, my earthly existence or the heavenly one? Yeah, it's very real. I'm clinging to things. I'm thinking of my wife. I'm thinking of my children. I'm like, Lord, they need me. I can't step through that doorway. I'm not ready. I back up from the door, and I'm just asked the logical question. Wait a second, Lord. That feels like heaven. What is this door? What is this? And he says to me, do you trust me? <laughs> right? Do not lean on your own understanding. Wait a second, Lord. Wait, 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 wait. Of course I trust you, Jesus. Of course I trust you. Now, what's the door? <laughs> is this what we do? Yes, Lord, I'll be obedient. I'll go anywhere for you, Jesus. Well, would you just go talk to your neighbor? No, I'll go to China. I will go to Russia. I'll go to the ends of the earth. Awesome. Would you just go have a beer with your neighbor and tell him that I love him? No. Okay. Jesus, I trust you. 
Would you just, you know, do what your boss is telling you to do? You know, submit to authority. Just do that. Jesus, to the ends of the earth, I'll do anything for you. Huh. Lord, what is this door? He says again, do you trust me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sure do. So walk through the door. Huh. And then the dream ended. It's just like that. Can I tell you, that dream has never left me. It lives in my conscience. It lives there. I see it every time I face a decision that I have to choose between what I understand and trusting him. I see it every single time. I know that on the other side of that door is not death, but it's eternal life. And in order to embrace, listen to me very clearly, in order to embrace everything that God has planned for your life, his goodness, if you want to see it and experience it for yourself, it, all of it is on the other side of the door of trust. Just stand to your feet this morning. Many times I've walked through that door, many times. And every single time I choose to trust the Lord over my own understanding. He makes my path straight and everything works out for his good and for mine. Even the stuff that's hard. Even the stuff that's difficult. Thanks, Seth. Did you put a hand on your own heart this morning? I don't know where you're at personally in your journey, but why don't you just invite him in? Don't be afraid. Listen, it says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open the door and invite me in, I'll come. I'll have fellowship with you. We'll talk things over. We'll... It's amazing what takes place when you simply open your hand to what you're controlling. Just invite him in but I know what he's going to want, okay? Actually, you don't. You should hear him out. <laughs> you don't even know what he's going to talk to you about until you're willing to talk to him. Just invite him in, Lord. I open my life. I open my business to you. I invite you in. Lord, I open our family to you. I invite you in. I, I op- Every place where, Lord, I have a closed door and I'm trying to control something, Lord, I invite you in. Would you begin to talk to me about those things? Come on, just do it. Don't be afraid. The fellowship of the Lord, it'll bring such peace and solution to your life. You just got to yield, though. You have to yield. So, Lord, this day, we choose to open our hands. We choose to trust you. We declare we trust you, Lord. God, the future of the nations, Lord, you know the goat nations. You know the sheep nations. You know peoples. Lord, and your plan is prevailing in the earth, and we refuse to make decisions out of fear. We trust you. We trust your leadership. We trust you, Lord. Holy Spirit of God, we are asking today that you would encounter each leader that's set in offices, that you'd speak to them, you guide them, Lord. God, we entrust our lives to you and we pray that you would get involved in the situations that are outside of our control. Is there an amen in this room today? Lord, we invite you in to our personal lives, to our journeys, Lord. I know my mother would not have chosen to pass away I know that she wouldn't have chosen that, but I understand, Lord, that there is bigger things involved than just individual preferences. And we trust your heart. We trust you. So, Lord, this day we surrender and we invite you, Lord, be the Lord of our life. Come on, if that's a reflection of your own heart this morning, just pray it to him. Lord, I trust you. I invite you in. Be the Lord of this church. Be the Lord of our community. Be the Lord, Lord of our city. Be the Lord of our state, our region. 
Jesus, our nation. Be the Lord of the nations. Be Lord over Israel. Be Lord over the surrounding peoples. Lord, rule and reign. Let peace govern these days. We thank you for that, God. We thank you for that, God. Now, Holy Spirit, fill us with wisdom and creativity that we might walk forward and carry out what you called us to and empower us to open our hands and continually trust, Lord, to not control outcomes. God, I bless your people this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. (laughs) May he be the guardian of your life. May the Lord keep you. May his countenance and his favor be what opens doors for you, not your prying. May his favor, his countenance be towards you. May he be gracious to you that you would know his goodness in all results and that the peace of God that surpasses understanding, may it guard your heart and mind. You would never again be tormented by outcomes that are not the ones you wanted. God, let your peace rule in every heart. I bless your people today in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And if anyone dared to agree with that, they said, amen, amen. Come on, can we give a good clap to the Lord this morning? God bless you guys. Pray that you have an amazing week, a wonderful Mother's Day. If you got a mom in your life, make sure you give them a call, hug, greet them real well. God bless you guys. Have a great, great afternoon.